We're seeing a radical collapse of Christian culture in the world today. Humanity is losing its bearings, its direction, because it's walking in the dark. A lot of people aren't seeking God sincerely. God wants to give a gift to the human race through Jesus. In Him there is no darkness. In God alone is light. In God alone is life. He wants to live His life in you and through you and extend it to the whole world. To be Christian means to live by the Spirit, to walk by the Spirit. That's what Christianity is all about, is saving people. Jesus is inside knocking on the door and He wants to come out. He's alive. He continues to save. The Kingdom of God is at hand because the King is on the throne. Hey, welcome to another week of The Choices We Face. We have a very special visitor today from Halifax, Nova Scotia, Canada. Hello and folks. Father James Mallon, welcome. Thanks very much, Ralph. It's great to be here. Yeah, it's good to have you. And we have Peter Herbeck with us. And it's Hi, always Peter. reassuring to have Peter you know, right by our side here on these programs and in the overall ministry that we're doing. Father James, why don't you just tell us a little bit about your story, You know, how, how, how you became a priest and what you're doing right now, we can then go from there. Sure. Uh, I am originally uh, from Scotland. I was born and raised in Scotland in a, a fairly traditional Catholic home, Irish Catholic home. I'm the oldest of four. And I grew up in a home where we never missed Mass. We were, I was told to say my prayers at night before I went to bed. Uh, but in many ways, that's where faith kind of ended. Um, my parents were, were people of strong faith. I remember as a kid bursting into my, my parents' bedroom one day and finding my dad on his knees praying. So I knew mm. my parents were people of prayer. Um, we came to Canada in, the in 1982, and my, some members of my father's family had moved in the early 70s, and they had gotten involved in charismatic renewal and had become very strange and religious. <laughs> yeah. They would send us Bibles and Ralph <laughs> Martin books. <laughs> oh, that's really over the edge. <laughs> yeah. I remember thinking, what, what on earth is this? They'd want to come over and lay hands on people and pray <laughs> yeah. for people. So we thought that was very, very odd. And uh, in, when I was in high school, I began to go through typical high school rebellion. Uh, I was always a good student. I did well at school, but started to get involved in a lot of partying and all of this stuff mm -hmm. and got into a little bit of trouble and at one point was forced to kind of examine where I was going uh, and was forced in a sense by my father to go on this youth retreat weekend. And on this weekend, I have to say that I, I came to know God in a personal way because I'd always had faith, I always prayed, I believed in God, but in many ways, uh, the God I believed in was a distant God, a mm -hmm. guy in the sky with a big stick who was gonna get you if you stepped out of line. Uh, on that particular weekend, I had an experience of the, of the total unconditional love of God it totally blew, blew me away. It changed my life. And I went back to school that following Monday, and uh, I think my friends thought I had been imbibing something at lunchtime because <laughs> yeah. I was on this high. And that, yeah. So it changed so much of my life. Other parts of my life didn't change. I wasn't really discipled properly, so I continued to party and maybe not live my life the, the way I was supposed to live. Uh, but over the next year or two, I continued to grow. Uh, I met this uh, young woman the end of grade 12, who I would be my girlfriend for a few years, and she wasn't Catholic. She was a very, from a very strong, uh, strong Reformed tradition and had a very, very strong faith. And between the work of the Holy Spirit in my life and her witness and influence on my life, uh, things began to change. I began to pray more. I began to read the scriptures every day. Mm -hmm. I had my first experience of charismatic renewal uh, after my first year at, at, at the university. And, um, and that really continued to deepen God's work in my life. I was in a pre-medical program. I got a scholarship in, into, into the uni university where I was, and uh, I was fixed in that kind of direction. One Sunday, uh, Easter Sunday in fact, at the end of my first year, I had an experience at Mass where, uh, to put it simply, all of a sudden I I sensed that God was going to call me. To, I, I knew I was going to be a priest. Is just something? bang, yeah. just like yeah. that. I mean, yeah. I'd, never, I'd never been an altar boy in my life. Yeah. Uh, and this, this was so powerful, I, I began to weep. It was very overwhelming. And from the moment Mass ended, I took that whole experience and I buried it and I, and I, and I ran from God because mm. there was no way I wanted to be a priest. Like, mm -hmm. forget it. Mm 
And I began to wheel and deal with God. I just, you know, let, let me get married and have a wife and run. I'll be a missionary, I'll yeah. be a doctor, <laughs> yeah. I'll be a deacon, I'll yeah. do this. Yeah. I began to bargain with God yeah. and uh, you can't, in the end you lose, that doesn't really work. And it was not so much because it was something from the outside, but something from within. They mm -hmm. just wouldn't go away, it wouldn't leave me alone. And f But a year later it came to a point of decision where I, I felt that I, I had to make this decision, I had to end this relationship, change my course of studies. The following year, I went out to a seminary in Mission, British Columbia, Seminary of Christ the King. Studied there for three years. Uh, did five years theology at University of Toronto for my, my diocese, the Archdiocese of Halifax. And I've now been ordained for 13 years. Right. So that's the Reader's Digest version yeah. of how uh, God called someone like me. And uh, at one point in my career as a priest, I was, or my work as a priest, I was vocation director. And the premise that I worked out of was if God can get me to be a priest, he can get anyone to be yeah. a priest. <laughs> <laughs> that, can we go back to that day just when you sensed you heard the Lord? Describe a little bit more what that was like for you. You were sitting there and how, how did you hear the Lord? What, when you, how did you know that you knew? The original experience yeah, the original of God's experience mercy of the call, or the, of the call, call to the priesthood? The priesthood yeah. How did I know I knew? Uh, it's hard to describe even now as I reflect back on it. It was I just knew it was it was uh, it was annoying. I Something was, that was infused into your being. I felt like I was going to explode. It was like it was like a sudden realization, a deep, deep, foundational realization. I'm going to be a priest. It was as simple as that. Yeah. And and it it, it made me shake. It made me tremble. Yeah. Uh, it was the realization was was overpowering, and it, it was just like that. Yeah. And and I ran from it for a year, and. The moment of turn for me happened. We were watching, I was involved in this youth, youth retreat and we were watching the uh, crucifixion scene from the movie, Jesus of Nazareth. Mm -hmm. And as I sat in this room with this group of people and I saw the image of Christ being lifted up on the cross, I really heard the Lord saying to me very gently, not in a condemning or a judgmental way, uh, James, uh, look what I did for you. And I became aware that I was, I was, I was, whole, I knew what he was asking and I was saying, no. Yeah. And I just, I broke down, I, I began to weep and everyone was looking at me, what's wrong with this guy? Yeah. And it was two days later that I broke off with my girlfriend to go mm -hmm. to the seminary. Yeah. Well, you know, we have such a short program, we're going to have to do a Reader's Digest version of your whole story. <laughs> yeah. Let's jump forward now because I know that you've become very involved in using media to communicate the gospel mm -hmm. and helping people grow in their faith. I know that you actually have a little video that you brought with us that we can share with our viewers. So let's take a look at that right now and sure. we'll come back and talk about what you're doing with media. Great, thanks. My name is Father James Mallon, I'm a Catholic priest, and I have a dog. And over the next eight weeks, I hope to share with you how my experience of my dog has enriched my experience with my God. <laughs> this course is not just going to be me talking. There are other presenters in this course. They will be appearing with us. My name is Dr. David Dean. I am a dogmatic theologian, and for the next eight weeks, I'll be speaking with you about some of the themes we're looking at in this series. And also each week, there's going to be a documentary testimony from someone who has experienced and lived these realities. We're going to look at God's love. We're going to look at what it means to be called into relationship with this God who is Father, Son, and Holy Spirit. The reality of sin, guilt, and forgiveness. We're going to look at what it means to be living in a relationship with Jesus. We're going to talk about scripture, the word of God. We're going to talk about the reality of suffering and death and eternal life. We hope that there will be something in these presentations for all of you, something that you can take with you. 
that some part of these presentations will speak to you where you are right now in your lives. You can never hear this stuff too many times. Um, as Christians, the message of God's love and forgiveness never gets old, so it's great to hear a new spin on it and uh, be provoked to think of things in a new way. It's just, it's just inspiring and, and uh, encouraging and hopeful. Just having finished the eighth week, trying to pull it all together, incredible talks, great speakers, great testimonials, and I'd recommend it for anybody. Well, Father, that was a pretty creative uh, video. T tell us, <laughs> tell us, kind of why you're doing this. Okay. Well, first, what? I want to show you we're not going to the dogs. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> yeah. So, and uh, you know, as you can see, the point is that this is not really about dogs. It's it's about it's about Christ. It's about uh, the basics of, of our of our faith. And the question is, when you evangelize, you've got to touch down. If you think of uh, of it as a kind of bridge, uh, you've got to touch the other end of the bridge down at the culture. And the culture right now is very crazy about dogs, and we can analyze that whether that's good or bad. Or, uh, but the point is that it connects with people. And uh, it's an attempt to use humor to be creative, to catch people and draw them in. Uh -huh. And uh, we've had a very good response so far. Um, the, the, the course itself is, it talks about uh, coming into relationship with Christ. It talks about the requirements of living under the Lordship of, of, of Christ. It deals with issues around suffering and death and some of the obstacles that we often have to, to being in, in a relationship with, with God, the, the, the role of Scripture. Um, and it's designed not just to you know, reach Catholics, church-going Catholics, or even fallen away Catholics, but we hope this course is actually going to reach out to non-Catholics, and we try to present it in a way that we're going to minimize uh, jargon or, or things that, that might be an obstacle to people who are not connected with church without uh, sacrificing our integrity as Catholics, you know, to mm -hmm. bring and repackage Catholic theology yeah. in a way that it can be received. Because we often, even when we speak of evangelization, limit evangelization in the Catholic Church, we talk about all those fallen away Catholics we need to reach. Well, our mission is more than that. Yeah. We're called to reach yeah. all people. Yeah. We're called to meet people, fallen away Catholics, uh, the Catholics in our pews, because sometimes, I'm sorry to say it, but as, as you know, Sometimes even the Catholics in our pews are, are not evangelized yeah. in that they, they've, they've got an idea of God, an idea of faith, but have not yet come into a full personal relationship. So you're really looking as your, your role as pastor of a, of a large parish there in Halifax as a missionary outreach. You're trying to use the parish and use your leadership to, is the to lead people. the fundamental reason why a parish exists. Now I, come, I live in Atlantic Canada. The fishing business used to be big there, and, and I've just moved to this new parish, a beautiful facility, and it brought together three previous parishes, and so the grace of this moment is that no one can say that's not how we do it here. Right now, <laughs> there's no way of doing things. <laughs> start from scratch. We get yeah. to start from scratch, yeah. and using a fishing analogy, uh, I, I'm, I, the church is a, is a fish processing plant. And we have a fleet of fishing boats to go out and fish. And we've got, this, we've got great boats and a great plant. Now, are we just going to have bingo and play cards in the fishing plant? Or are we going to process <laughs> yeah. fish? Yeah. You know, are we going to put these good fishing boats to use? I mean, I can't man them, but I've got to bring people who, who can and go out and, and fish. Yeah. So and, you're trying to activate the committed Catholics to become people who reach out and, and, are, and are looking for an opportunity to bring people to Christ. There's two reasons for this. One, of course, is the mandate of Christ himself, who says that this is what we have to do. Uh, the second is a more perhaps selfish reason is that if we don't, we're not going to be here. Yeah. And the forces that compelled these three churches to, to combine and be one, I mean, right now it looks great. We've got all these people in church. We've got this nice new big building. But if, if we don't fundamentally change the, the culture of our church, these forces are still active. 20 years from now, we're going to be doing this. The same forces thing. of secularization. Yeah. Forces of secularization. Yeah. Decline is going to just keep happening, just keep shrinking. That's right. So you're trying to move with the people who are in the church from a maintenance model to a mission model. And these programs and other things help move people into that context, the deeper personal conversion and engaging directly the mission of the church Absolutely. in some way. And, so, and to, for people to be inviters. We have to have programs, good programs, and there are many out there that are easy to invite people to. They're accessible. They don't put up obstacles to mm -hmm. people. 
you know, often... You don't have to kind of be an expert in the Catholic faith in order to understand what's going on, but they're geared to people who don't really maybe have a clue yeah. about what it means to See, be a Catholic. what's important is that we often mess, mix up catechesis with evangelization. Mm -hmm. And going into this new parish, I, I asked my bishop, you know, Bishop, did I have your permission to put into action a, a kind of new pastoral model? And he said, yes, you do. Go, go for it. Put something in writing and I'll back you up. And one of the things I've said to the staff is I want to make a foundational distinction between catechesis and evangelization because sometimes we mix them. Now, sometimes in the documents, the document by Paul VI, Evangelization in the Modern World, it defines catechesis as a part of evangelization, mm -hmm. but he's quite clear too that evangelization has as its source and its summit a, a, a distinct proclamation of the person, the name, uh, the work of Jesus Christ and calling people into relationship with him. And so often we're giving people information about Christ, about mm. God, who have not yet had that fundamental yeah. encounter with Christ and the Holy Spirit, to be filled with the Holy Spirit. Mm -hmm. and, and so we need uh, programs that deal with primary proclamation and evangelization mm -hmm. so when people experience this, then they can come into catechesis. Mm -hmm. Then they can come into sacramental preparation. Now, I know one of the big challenges right now for the, the Catholic Church in many countries, I know in the United States as well as Canada, is people come to get married or they, they, it's come time for confirmation or they want their children baptized. And a lot of times they don't, when they say they want a Catholic church wedding, they mean they want a good setting for the photographer. Yeah. You know what I mean? Like, right. what, what do you do for people who are coming to the church, maybe with a lack of clarity or a lack of conversion? I think, I think the first and primary thing is that we have to recognize the, the unique blessing that we have as Catholics that for good reasons or bad reasons, people still come to us. Yeah. And I've often said to my staff, I'll take people for the worst reasons. I've had people call me and say, I want to get married in your church because I like the stage. Great, come in and see me. Yeah. Yeah. I get to talk to you about, about the Lord. And, and I was able, and, and I pitched to people, I'd say, look, I'm not in the marriage business, I'm in the faith business, I'm interested in your faith. And to get married in my church, if you want me to be your pastor, uh, you need to be a member of my flock. And we've got a program that we run uh, for people who've been away from the church, and this is a requirement. Two out of every three couples said, okay. And they take the course. Wow. And half of them would have conversion experience. We did. We, we, we baptize people out of it. Mm -hmm. And so I'm convinced that this is the way to go, that we've got to put our, our, we've got to put into action all of this nice theory that exists out there because the catechism itself uh, says that when it comes to sacraments, they must, quote, must be preceded by evangelization, faith, and conversion. Yeah, and that's oftentimes like, overlooked or not understood yeah. and because of the pressure and hey if we don't baptize them or if we don't confirm them or if we don't marry them they'll just go somewhere else and so they're not getting that yeah. we've our sacramental preparation has been based around timelines and to somehow pause the process or to make it longer or to postpone it is somehow seen as a rejection of the person and and of course we don't like to do that rather than saying you know let's work with you until you're ready which is a more of a discipleship yep. mentoring model yep. that we will work with yep. you and tailor a process that is yep. unique to you let's and your family. Let's see how the Holy Spirit works in your life and what yeah. pace you go at. And, things and let's like bring that. you yeah. to the sacraments when you're ready for them. Yeah. Uh, so many Father, so many young people are living together before they get married. What, what do you do in those situations when well, they come, they haven't been involved in the church in a long time and they're living together and they say, hey, Father, we love each other. We want to get married in your church. My parents, it, it depends, you know, this is their parents. It depends on their level of faith. If they come to me saying, Father, we're, we're really strong Catholics and we're committed to their faith and then I find out they're living together, I put the boots to them. I put the <laughs> boots to them all the time. If they come to me and they don't have a clue who Jesus yeah. is, they don't know God, That's not where you start. I don't even bring it up. That's chapter 16. Yeah. They yeah. don't have chapter 1. Yeah, they don't and have I the find, reason why not to. They, they don't have the motivation They don't have a the context reason why not except to. that yeah. it's simply this rule. If you, bring, if you bring them into a program where they experience Christian community, they hear the proclamation of the gospel, they experience Christ, they experience the Holy Spirit, and they have conversion, I found that by the time it comes to have that conversation, they've already made a decision. Yeah. Something's already happened. Because like so Paul, we, you know. We Paul, focus, in yeah. the church we often approach people who are practically non-believers on ethical issues expecting them to act like believers. Yeah, yeah. yeah. Forget it, let's yeah. help them to be believers first. Yeah, yeah. it's like St. Paul talks about in Second Corinthians, he says, you know, now that we've come to know the Lord, now we make it our aim to please Him. Mm -hmm. You know, once that, that heart falls in love, yes. now I want to do it. Tell me what He wants me to do, exactly. I want to do it. Yeah. And people become hungry yeah. for knowledge as well, so catechesis becomes much more effective. You know, in the Great Commission, there's four verbs. There's the command to, to go, to make, to teach, and to baptize. 
And it's very interesting, in the Greek text, only one of those verbs is a finite verb. The other three are participles, so they're somehow Ongoing. conditional. Mm -hmm. So one, one of those verbs is the hinge of the Great Commission. And wherever I go, I often say this, and I, I ask people to put up their hands, and without exception, every single time, the least amount of people choose the right answer. Uh, the finite verb is make, make disciples. Well, we're pretty good at going as Catholics. We're all over the place. You open the yellow pages in any city in the world, we're there. We're fairly good at teaching. Uh, we're great at baptizing. <laughs> Our one weakness is making disciples. That's really true. Making disciples, but that is the heart of the Great Commission. Yeah. It's hard work to make disciples. It's a lot easier just to have a, a two-week class and to do baptisms and confirmations and weddings and first communions and not worry about it. That has to change because the very life of the church depends on it. Well, Father James, you know, this is, this is such a breath of fresh air. Isn't yeah, it, it sure is, I yeah. Mean, just to hear this. And I know people are going to say, how can I get in touch with Father James? And do you have a website? Or how can I find out about your materials? You know, sure. Do you have materials that other people can use? Well, you know? our website for the Media Institute, we founded a Media Institute a number of years ago because, you know, we, you know I see you've got a book in front of you, Ralph, but... You know, well, you're doing t TV, this is great, but, you know, uh, the printed word isn't necessarily going to reach the younger generation. So we, we must be involved using the modern means of communication, and it should be good quality. So that was a conviction that led us to bring together a group of uh, media professionals and to produce me media. So that's the John Paul II Media Institute. I'm a great fan of uh, Pope John Paul II. And uh, the, media, the website is www.jp2mi.ca. And from there, you can link to some of our different programs. Could you say it again slowly without J your Scottish uh, birth? <laughs> yeah. yes. Number two, yes. JP2, yeah, it's yeah. on the screen, jp2mi.ca. And from there, you can link to some of our other programs. Uh, and my own, I think my own webpage might be like linked up there. Great. Okay. Otherwise, you can Google me. Okay, so people can go to that website. From there, they can find exactly. your materials. And, exactly. Yeah, you know, get in touch with you, that type yeah. of thing. Yeah, well, that's, that's great. That's super. Well, you said, you know, the big challenge for us is to make disciples. Somebody asked you the question, well, what is a disciple? What do you mean, Father? What are we, well, what are we making exactly? Well, I mean, the, how do you do it? You know, I've, people say to me, well, so-and-so is a Catholic. And I have to confess, I don't know what that means anymore. Yeah. It can mean 20, it can mean nothing. It can yeah. mean 20 different sure. things. What I want to know as a parish priest is, who are the disciples? A disciple, the Greek word for disciple is mathete. So it come, the, the English word math, that's where we get the word from. Manthano means to teach, to, 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 to uh, learn. Mm -hmm. So, to be a disciple is, to, is the one who's engaged in a learning process. Uh, the Latin word discipulus, we get the word discipline from. So I, I define a disciple as someone who's engaged in a lifelong discipline process of learning, of following Jesus the Lord. You can be a Catholic, you can go to church and not be a disciple. So the call is to discipleship and that means it's an ongoing process. None of us are ever finished. And as we know, the, the more we're in this, the further a way we feel, you know, it's like, Lord, I'm, I'm even further behind than, than, I, than I was when I began. Because it never ends. We never mm -hmm. end learning, growing towards the Lord. And, and so it, it'll change the culture of our church because Sunday school isn't going to finish at ninth grade anymore. It's a lifelong process. Adult faith formation will become the norm, not just the stuff for the religious wackos in the basement on Thursday nights. It becomes normative to be a good yeah. Catholic yeah. to do these things. It makes me think about what Pope John Paul II had said years ago when he was talking about the movements and the discipleship that happens in the movements. He said, you know, they all have a gift and a charism to help bring people to conversion, falling in love with Christ, and that leads to communion. That leads to community, shared life, accountability, mm -hmm. which leads to a passion together for truth and orthodoxy and want to Absolutely. grow in the faith. But he said all three of those steps are geared towards something. He said that's mission. Mature discipleship means you've gone through this and you're engaging in the mission of the church and helping extend the kingdom of God in the world consciously and personally with your life and your resources. You know, and, and, and a lot of people feel like that must be a very special vocation to be involved in the mission of the church. But it really, one of the, one of the really things that Vatican II is trying to uncover is the significance of baptism. Absolutely. We're, we're baptized into life with Christ, the person of Christ, and, and it's just part of being baptized. We've still got a long way to get out from the kind of clericalism that, that pervaded our church for many, many years. I'm very, hard, very sorry to say that. Uh, I'm a priest. I love the priesthood. Uh, the priesthood is distinctive within the church, but we had um, uh, an overemphasis. You know, uh, ministry in the church uh, was, was basically dominated by, by priests so that we became the religious professionals, and in a, in a sense, we became uh, kind of surrogates. For lay people, so lay people say, well, I can't be holy, so you've got to do it for me. I can't be a missionary, you've got to do it for me. 
And uh, in some ways, that's still active in the church. Mm -hmm. The call to mission, the call to be evangelizers, the call to holiness is rooted not in ordination, but in baptism. Right, right. That's still so undiscovered and ununderstood and unembraced. So we've got a lot of work cut out for us. We do, one step at a time. Yeah, yeah. Well, hey, you know, we're going to take a little break right now because we want to tell people about a new booklet they can get, a new Pentecost. And, you know, one of the things that John Paul II said is we can't have a new evangelization unless we have a new Pentecost. We really need the power of the Holy Spirit to come alive in people's lives so they kind of get it, you know, so they kind of see who Jesus is, so they have that fire in their heart that you had in their heart. So we're going to offer people the booklet. And then when we come back, I'm wondering if you could pray for all the pastors and all the parishes and all the bishops as people watch and say, oh, I wish Father James was my pastor. Oh, my pastor needs to hear this. Or, oh, I wish this could happen in my parish. So you can just kind of ask the Lord to keep on unfolding this new springtime that, that you've been pioneering in so many ways. Four popes in a row have now asked us to fervently pray for a new Pentecost. They know that what we need is an outpouring of God's Spirit. I've written a booklet about what this new Pentecost is and how we can personally appropriate more of the Holy Spirit. We'd like to make it available as a gift from us to you. Just call 1-800-282-4789 or go to our website, renewalministries.net. Click on New Booklet, and we'll send you your own copy. Come, Holy Spirit. None of what Father James has been speaking about can happen without a new Pentecost, and none of it can happen without us personally making contact with the Holy Spirit. Send for the booklet. It will be a help. Father James, could you kind of just uh, gather up these wonderful things we've been speaking about and, and extend them to everybody who's been listening today? Sure. And just before I pray, I just want to... Uh, say to people, ask you to pray for me. You know, we talked about new methods and to and what it takes to Im- implement these things. I often say, you know, I don't have certainty that this is the answer, this is going to work. But I know for certainty that what we are doing right now is not working. Yeah. And we need to have the courage to try new things. Um, and even if they're not the right answer, at least they can't be worse than what we've got. And we've got <laughs> to have courage. So let's, let's pray. In the yeah. name of the Father, and the Son, and the Holy Spirit. Amen. Lord, we thank you for the gift of faith. We thank you for the gift of your Son. We thank you for the gift of the Spirit, the gift of the Church. Lord, we pray for a continued renewal of your Church um, from the shepherds down to to every single member, Lord, uh, through the power of your Spirit. We pray, Lord, in a special way for the priests and the bishops. We pray, Lord, for that we may be shepherds after your own heart, that we may first reach out to people, no matter who they are, where they come from, with compassion, with acceptance, with open hearts. And yet, Lord, not be afraid to invite them into, to come to know your Son and to make the commitment of discipleship. Not be afraid to proclaim the gospel to them, even if it means some of them might walk away. Because, Lord, this is what you did in your ministry. You sometimes let people walk away. So we ask, Lord, for hearts of love and for courage uh, to put into place in our parishes a program not just to prepare people for sacraments and to catechize and give information, but a program of evangelization where people can come into personal relationship with you and be empowered by your Spirit and so that the sacraments can come to life and so that people can hunger and thirst for more knowledge. So Lord, give your blessing to all pastors and bishops and continue to bless us in our ministries. We pray through Christ our Lord. Amen. Amen. Thank you, Father James. Thank you, Peter. Same time, same place next week, the choices we face.